Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are here to present the spray pyrolysis for the synthesis of nano ceramic powders. Uh, my name is Juan Diego Estefan, and these are my partners, E.P. Meta and Laura Reyes. Our advisor is Dr. Chang. Okay, uh, this is a presentation outline of how our presentation is going to flow. We're going to start and present the uh, problem that we have, the solution that we have for it, our results analysis, and we'll conclude our work for you. Okay, our engineering problem is to design, implement, and optimize an in-house spray pyrolysis system to synthesize nano, uh, high temperature nano ceramic powders. This system has to adjust for a variety of materials, including uh, metal oxides to metal carbides. Uh, these nano ceramic powders, are, we're gonna create them so that they help yield better strength and hardness in ceramics. And the system has to help realize a simplified and more economical means uh, than traditional approaches already done. Uh, the spray process has a potential for low cost, continuous, and scalable production of nano ceramic powders. Okay, so ceramics have been around for a very long time. They're generally known as brittle. Uh, they have, they're composed of uh, inorganic uh, compounds and they range from uh, non-metallic to metallic elements. Um, they are, the atomic bonding goes from purely atomic to completely covalent. Uh, on the other hand, nano ceramic powders have been uh, synthesized for less than four, 40 years. Uh, they have a high melting temperature, uh, high modulus of elasticity, hardness, and strength, and they are uh, chemically resistant. Okay, so what is spray pyrolysis? Uh, basically, it's a three-step process. It begins uh, with a precursor solution that you'll see right here. Uh, the solution is atomized by a nebulizer and atomizer, and uh, the droplets formed are carried into the furnace. And in the furnace, it goes through evaporation, and once uh, the constituent elements are left, uh, they are uh, a chemical reaction occurs, and then a powder is formed, and the powder is then collected at the end, the collection mechanism. Uh, the effective parameters for spray paralysis can be the droplet size, velocity, the rate of atomization, the uh, temperature, and the atmosphere. Okay, so now that we know what we're doing, uh, we want to ensure that we create a lab-scale spray paralysis in-house system that's scalable, continuous, cost-effective, and mostly flexible, and it's able to work with uh, metal oxides and metal carbides. So the constraints and considerations that affect the cost and flexibility of our project are um, starting with the furnace that you see pictured here. It's a horizontal furnace. Also the capabilities of the said uh, uh, the temperature capabilities of the said horizontal furnace and the available space that we have in the, in the lab here on FIU. Okay, so in this project we uh, had to adhere to some standards set forth by uh, some by the ISO, SAE, and ASTM. For example, the uh, silicone rubber tubing meets the standards set by the ASTM. Uh, also, the warm drive clamps used meet a uh, standard set by the SAE. <coughs> uh, into the design alternates, the first one that we have is a uh, low flow peristaltic tump, uh, pump and a Teflon mirror mist, mirror mist nebulizer. Uh, some of the advantages are the pump for this design has a wide flow rate range, which would help increase uh, the production rate, make it more uh, efficient, and a small droplet size. The, the droplet size is important because the smaller droplets that you create uh, result in a smaller uh, powder form at the end when they're synthesized. Uh, the disadvantage is that just these two components alone cost $1,500, so it's the mo uh, most costly of our design alternates. Also, the nebulizer tip, it's uh, difficult to handle because it's, it's easily damaged. Okay, the second design alternate we have is the Drive Medical um, Power Nab Ultra Nebulizer. Uh, this has the advantage that it doesn't require a pump. It's uh, very uh, economical and it creates a small droplet size as well. Uh, the disadvantage is that it's made of plastic so it's susceptible to high temperatures. Uh, the container for the solution is very small, so it, it's not conducive to uh, a continuous production rate. And, uh, and uh, the seal created by the, the actual product, it's not very tight, so it could be a problem with uh, uh, producing carbides. Okay, and the third design alternate that we have is a submerged ultrasonic uh, nebulizer that we built in-house. 
Um, the advantages of this one, it's also uh, cost effective, creates a very small um, droplet size. But the main advantage that we want to emphasize is that it's compatible with any solution. It has a good seal, so it's flexible for our needs for carbides and for oxides. The only real disadvantage is that uh, the setup is we pretty much had to construct the whole setup. It's a lengthy design process. So our proposed design is a design alternate three, which is making our own in-house nebulizer. The reason we chose it is that it's a good design experience for the team. It's also very economical, um, flexible, cost-effective, scalable, and continuous. So we divided the system components into three sections. There are some parts we bought off the shelf, which are as follows. The first is the nebulizer board. It runs on a frequency of 1.7 megahertz. The second is the power supply which has a 48 volt AC uh, for the nebulizer board. The third is the tubing. It's crush resistant uh, silicon rubber tubing, uh, depending, it's also high temperature. And the last one is the breadboard and resistors. These we needed because the power supply wasn't giving us the output we needed, so we had to use the uh, circuit to bring it down to 40 volts. Next is parts we designed and then got custom manufactured. The first one is adopting flanges for the furnace tube which would connect the tube, uh, the furnace tube to the tubing we have. Um, these are made out of stainless steel, high temperature, and we made the outer diameter of these where we connect the tubing to be slightly larger than the inner diameter of the tubing so that there's a tight fit. The next is the glassware we needed to hold the solution. The first uh, glassware is the 500 milliliter three-neck flask used to a flat flange. Um, this, is, this will hold the precursor solution. The second is the 90 degree male two holes adapter. This will connect to the middle neck of the flask and then be connected to the tubing on the host side. The third piece is the carrier gas inlet, which will go into one of the side necks of the flask and this will be for the carrier gas connection. The picture on your left shows the complete setup of the flask. The carrier gas inlet, um, the middle neck, which has the tubing connected to it, and then the right neck to pour in the solution. So next is parts we um, designed and manufactured. They are the collection container. Um, these are plastic containers with holes drilled under the top and the bottom to um, connect the tubing on the side. I'm sorry. Um, the more containers we add, that increases the product yield up to a certain amount. Um, the second is the nebulizer base, which is a plastic container with a hole at the bottom, and then we glue the nebulizer board to it, and then fill this with water, and then we place our collection, um, our or solution flask over this. The third part, which is very important, is the clamp, which is made out of Teflon and brass rings with a Teflon base. This will be clamped onto the flat flange on the glassware, and then this will separate the solution, precursor solution, with the water inside the uh, nebulizer base. Our complete system looks like this. On the left, you can see, on the left, you can see um, the uh, glassware connected to the furnace tube on the left side. And then on the right side, we collect it into the collection container. We connect those with the tubing, the flange. Our total cost of the system was $1,135, which was under our budget of $3,000. The most expensive part was getting the flanges made for the furnace tube, which costed us about $500. Next, to calibrate um, and to make sure that we were actually getting the temperature we set the furnace tube, we took uh, temperature measurements every inch of the furnace tube with a thermocouple. So this shows a plot of that going from the left end of the furnace to the right end. The furnace tube is 40 inches long. So as we see, we set the furniture, uh, the furnace to 850 degrees Celsius. And then you can see here that's, that's what we got. So this was calibrated. Next, we started with making zirconium oxide and process to make the zirconium carbide. Some advantages of zirconium oxide are that it's high, it, has, it has a high melting point, it's highly abrasive, it's thermally insulating and fire, fire resistant. The applications include electronic displays, coatings, medical and dental implants, and solid oxide um, cells. On your right, you can see a material properties chart of the zirconium oxide. So the solution we used was zirconium dinitrate oxide hydrate dissolved in water, um, varying on different ratios. Some of our operation conditions here listed are the temperature of the furnace set to 850 degrees Celsius. The gas flow rate we varied from one to two liters per minute. The carrier gas we varied 
um, between compressed air and oxygen. The precursor solution we used was zirconium um, dinitrate oxide hydrate dissolved in water. We stirred it manually for a minute and then using a magnetic stir plate for five minutes. And then the ratio we varied from 40 to 1 to 100 to a water to the precursor powder. So this is the SEM results. Um, so you can see in the images uh, increasing magnification. The last the scale of the images is right there. Uh, this is a 10 micron scale, 10 micron scale, uh, 1 micron scale, and then 100 nanometer scale. You can see the powders here. Um, we, we had a uniform agglomerate size of 1 to 5 microns, and then a grain size, which you see here on the border, um, those that we had a grain size average of 10 nanometers. So we were able to make nanostructured powder. Um, also on this scale, you can see that these um, particles that are nanosized, and in general, uh, 1 to 5 agglomerates, 1 to 5 micron agglomerates. So the second analysis that we conducted was through X-ray diffraction. Um, you can see from the data of the peaks and using the Schnurz equation, tau equals gamma times k over beta plus a theta, we're able to estimate a crystallized size. So using the position from the peaks, and the full width at half maximum values, we're able to estimate an average size of 9.48 nanometers. There are certain health and safety considerations that have to be taken into account when using the system. The first is when we use toxic chemicals. It is important to wear goggles, masks, and gloves in order to avoid skin contact and prevent inhaling toxic fumes. Um, there is also has to be caution when dealing with the electronics as they're being used close to open water containers and if water splatters, it could cause electric shock. Um, and it's also necessary to wear high temperature gloves because the furnace gets really hot and the elements that are near it can burn. The system has relatively inexpensive maintenance. The tubing, the deletion cell, and the bubbler have to be cleaned every time after testing with the air water. And the furnace can be sporadically cleaned um, in order to avoid cross-contamination and for the results to be compromised. Our project is able to have an environmental impact because the materials utilized help advanced technologies that create cleaning burn, cleaner burning rocket engines and more efficient energy systems like turbines and hydroelectric power plants. They also um, help increase the longevity of the elements, which decreases waste. Um, there's an economic impact as uh, this project advances research in an economical manner, and it creates a scalable system that can be easily placed in industrial settings to, up to at, in a, at a low cost. We were able to obtain our lifelong learning experience by working with long-term goals. Uh, design components and experiments. We worked with people from different professional backgrounds and were able to obtain experience in different engineering disciplines like electrical and materials engineering. Um, our project has a global perspective as the ceramic powders help um, in, uh, create and advance technologies that create better energy systems which better the environment. We were able to incorporate global awareness by creating a multilingual user's manual and converting the cost of the system to different currencies for people's reference. We have a global engagement because uh, this project affects the, the community here in Florida as well. The number one energy provider, FPL, uh, accounted that only 1% of the total energy comes from solar energy. And there are three new energy plants created that are going to be completed by 2016. And this will shift its focus to solar energy. Uh, these powders helped enable and made this possible. This chart uh, distributes our goals in a timeline. And this chart represents how we distributed our responsibilities and tasks through the project. As an improvement, we recommend adding a variable AC transformer to power the nebulizer board. We would like to use more flexible tubing 
and add more bubblers in order to increase product yield. Um, and also, it would be recommended to add a separatory, uh, separatory funnel for continuous precursor uh, solution flow. In conclusion, we were successful at designing, machining, and implementing a spray pyrolysis system. We ran proof of concept experiment for synthesizing zirconium oxide. Um, we demonstrated advantages and identified areas of improvement for the spray pyrolysis system as well. As a future work, the system will be test, tested for zirconium carbide and other high temperature non-oxide ceramic powders by Dr. Cheng's graduate student. Thank you. Thank you. What, what was your precursor solution? Oh, zirconium. It was a zirconium powder with DI water. Was the zircon so zirconium powder Zir was dissolved in the DI water. water. So uh, in in your precursor solution, uh, the zirconium was fully in solution with the DI water, or was the was it just a carrier? The, the Could you repeat that? Okay. The, the the question I'm asking is the precursor solution that you've created is basically that zirconium powder with DI water. Yes, sir. And this, uh, so the zirconium powder is not uh, dissolved in the water. It's basically floating in the water? No, it's dissolved. It's dissolved. It's like a salt. It's, it has little small size particles, but it's basically dissolved. We used the stir plate to make it like as, um, I guess, dis as dissolved as possible in the, so that the powder doesn't like just stay at the bottom. Okay. So we used to manually stir it. For, we actually started where we only stirred it uh, manually. And that didn't um, nebulize properly, so we uh, used the magnetic stir plate to stir it for further five minutes so that the particles did not better. And, and what was the size of the precursor powder? The size particles. Of the, oh. We didn't That's perform an analysis on the, yeah. the precursor. Were they the nano size. size or were they bigger than nano size? They were bigger than nano size. Okay. Once they were atomized, though, they were uh, micron size. But the nanoscript turned um, gray size. Okay. So the next question I have for you was, why did you decide to use a horizontal furnace? That was the constraint. Um, that was the furnace available in the lab. So do you get com do you get powder forming at an earlier stage? Uh, do you, when you go to clean out a system, is there powder all the way through the tube? Yeah, yeah. There's powder. We found powder on the tubing. Um, and yes. Yeah. And, the inner. and is some of the powder in the tube larger than some of the powder at the other end? We actually had a hard time scraping it off the tube. Um, but we did read that usually like the powder that would be like closer to the core would be smaller than what we collected. Than what you collected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you do any thermal profiling? I saw the thermal profile of the furnace, but did you do any thermal profiling of the system when you were actually running the system? The, it was done while it was yeah, running. Yeah, Okay, so the profiles I saw was when you're actually Ready. performing. Correct. Okay, good. Um, that's, that's basically my questions. Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, probably want to ask something. Uh, of course, I'm a mechanical <laughs> engineering student, so I'm not too familiar with the chemistry. The, it's a salt. They were using the oxy nitrate. Oxynitrate, which is a completely solvable salt, which when you dissolve it, you don't have powder. It's a clear, transparent solution. Perfect, thank you. It's not a study from powder. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> which is not too familiar with students. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, thank you.